Hi, I'm Umbreon Libris, and welcome back to Art School. Last time we made a fake mon directly into pixel art so that I could show you some techniques of how to make Gen 1 style sprites. I called it water. Some of you guys suggested other names, but most of you actually really liked water, so we'll keep going with that for now. Today we're going to take the next step and make official art of water in the style of Ken Sugimori's art from the Gen 1 and Gen 2 eras. And to make sure I do a good job of teaching you the ins and outs of this style, I invited an expert to be our guest lecturer today. My name is Rachel Briggs. I am a semi-professional monsterologist and artist. <laughs> I'm just a fan of animals and creatures, whether they're real or fake. Biology or, like, you know, speculative biology is just super interesting to me. I have to apologize for the poor audio quality there. We had some technical troubles when recording. It does get better later on in the call, but if you're having trouble understanding, I did make closed captions for this episode. Rachel has been into the old style art since the very beginning. When I was a kid and Red and Blue had like just come out in the US, that would be like 1998. I was looking through, I didn't, I didn't have a Game Boy yet. This is a big deal. Because I would always go, like, we had an NES and stuff when I was a kid, but I didn't have a Game Boy, and I would always look through, like, the Toys R Us catalogs for the holidays and circle every Game Boy game I wished I had. And so Pokemon came out, and I was like, I want this so bad, because the, the entire theme of the game was catching weird animals, which I already didn't realize, like, all the time. So it's like, oh, man, I really want this game. And then Nintendo Power around that time had these, like, monthly inserts. It was, like, a little pull-out extra magazine that was all just Pokemon stuff. But there's something about that art. It was very organic back then. Like, you could, even though they're very obviously fantasy creatures, you could imagine them, like, running around in the woods or whatever and having an adventure with them. I think nowadays the art has gotten more, like, polished and rounded and stuff. I almost say toyetic. Like you can look at any modern Pokemon art and go, oh, I can see how you can make a plastic figure out of that. Which is not to say that's a bad thing, but back then it was more like, oh, that's an animal. <laughs> Rachel has become very well known for her vintage Sugimori style artwork, especially of cut Pokemon that were revealed during the Space World demo and other leaks. And she learned that style just by looking at it. But I've never seen any video or anything of him showing or talking about what specific tools he used. There were, have also been like gallery showings in various parts of the world of some of the original Sugimori art. And there's thankfully some visitors took very high quality photos of some of those. And there's one in particular that I've got that's a photo of the Mew art from Red and Green. And on the bottom of the page, because it's the original watercolor paper, is the water for the maker of the paper so it's like ooh <laughs> and it's like canson fine face paper which is just, you know a typical type of watercolor paper but it was interesting seeing it you know i was able to like gauge about how big this art was which is probably like maybe three and a half or so inches tall it's like they're decently sized the image galleries on Bulbapedia are a great resource for studying this art style even though a lot of the scans are not super high quality in the art from Red and Green, the poses of the Pokémon are fairly static. They usually just match the poses from the sprites. And there's not a lot of dimension to the color. The shading seems to be done just by varying the intensity of the same color. You mix your colors once, and you just use more layers or more heavily pigmented layers to create the shadows. The art for Blue is way more dynamic. He even uses different colors. I guess he, maybe you got a new paint set. You can especially see it in, like, the purples and stuff. There's like this really dramatic like blue shading on a bunch of them. It's very interesting. The art for gold and silver is somewhere in between, but across the board the technique is pretty consistent and it's not very advanced. So let's get drawing. Before I get to watercolors I have to sketch it out. Sketching digitally is my preference and Rachel's as well just because it's easier to fix things. I'm not sure why I decided to make the stripes going down water side into tube-like things, or why I made it look kind of layered, but I thought it looked good. Now I've got to trace this onto paper. I'm using Arches watercolor paper. It's very high quality and has about the right texture. You don't need anything fancy for tracing. You could just put your paper on your monitor and trace it that way. I've used a window in the past, but I have this light pad that gives you a nice amount of backlighting. 
For the line work, I'm using waterproof India ink and a dip pen. It's just the material I'm most used to. You could use a fine brush or an inking pen. Just make sure the ink is very black and most importantly that it's waterproof. And make sure the drawing implement makes lines of consistent width. I'm going to start putting in colors with a wet on wet technique. That's when you're adding paint to an area that's already wet, which allows the paint to spread out gently. Always start out with the lighter colors because if you make mistakes they're easier to cover up. So I'll start by wetting the whole area we want to color yellow. The important thing to keep in mind is that watercolor, you can always add paint, but it's very difficult to take it off. So if you want an area to be white, you don't want to put any paint on it. Start with a light layer of color and add to it as you go, trying to keep the paper from drying out before you're done. Between colors, it's a good idea to let it dry. That way you don't have the colors bleed into each other. And if you do accidentally add too much color, you can use a paper towel to dab it while it's still wet, and you can remove most of that paint before the paper can absorb it. And you can also wrangle the paint to a degree if it's not spreading in the way you wanted or expected. You can use a wet brush with clean water and use it to push the paint where you want it. And if you take too long to finish an area and the paint dries before your next layer, a damp brush can also help you blend those layers better. And the red and green ones, they almost never had shading on black. It would be solid black, except for like black, I guess, which ends up being kind of gray, blue. And later on, they're like, okay, I guess we can like have shading on black, especially in uh, the Gen 2 stuff. You'll see like Murkrow or whatever isn't solid black. It has shading on it. Since there's so much black on this design, I'm going to go for the Gen 2 approach and shade it just like the rest of the piece. I'm actually using gouache instead of watercolor here. Gouache is very similar to watercolor, but it's more opaque, so you get deeper, richer colors more easily. But of course, this also means you have to be more careful with keeping the paint from going onto the highlights. I'm using black gouache mixed with a bit of blue watercolor just to give the blacks a bit of dimension. Now that the base colors are done, it's time for some real shading. I'm looking at the blue art here and using some new colors for the shading, especially the blues where I added some red. Here I'm using a different technique, wet on dry, meaning your paper is dry when you put paint on it. This means the paint won't spread out at all, and so you get very clean, solid borders to your area of color. This is almost done now, but you can see here at the bottom, I actually went outside the lines a lot which sucks, but there is a way to minimize it. Even though the paint is dry, wetting it again and gently rubbing it with your brush can activate the paint again so you can use a paper towel to remove it. And that one's done. This was actually my first attempt at the vintage Sugimori style in actual watercolors. Not bad for a first try. Next, I'm gonna do basically the same thing, but now in Photoshop, which is a lot more forgiving. That's part of why I like digital so much. It's like anything you can fix, you can fix any mistake with digital. And even like with acrylic or something, you can just paint over it, but watercolor is like, nope, it looks like that now. People always ask about my brush settings and they're not actually that complicated. I made this pen brush that's it's just a regular round hard brush, but it's like got a little bit of wobble to it and like a little bit of size difference and stuff so that it kind of looks like it textured on paper. Having smoothing on your brush is also super helpful for keeping your curves, well, smooth, something that I didn't quite accomplish on paper. Notice that in both the digital one and the traditional one, I'm using the same line thickness, whether it's an outside line or even just a pattern. Now I have to create the color areas. This is like the digital equivalent of wetting the paper one section at a time to make sure your colors don't bleed into each other. I have an action that automatically sets up a flat layer from whatever I select and then locks the transparency, meaning that I can't paint outside the lines. It's a good idea to make separate layers, not just for different colors, but also for different parts of the drawing to keep things neat. I eye drop rust like all of the old art because he had very specific palettes he used. It's weird trying to duplicate the watercolor process digitally, but it's not that different. I'll fill the whole thing in white and then paint the color 
in over those spots rather than like you know coloring and putting white highlights on because that's essentially what you're doing with the watercolor anyway you're adding the color to the white there's many watercolor brushes you can find online but to imitate the wet on wet technique you need it to be soft and not totally opaque so that you can layer it smoothly but if you're not getting it smoothly enough you can use a smudging tool to push the paint around and blend the colors better, very much like a damp brush. To imitate the wet on dry technique for the darker shades, the brush should have pretty hard edges. I don't always do it, but sometimes I'll afterwards I'll add a paper texture like on the top because it gives that kind of scan look back to it and just makes it look a little like more realistic. <laughs> And there we go. There's a pretty decent imitation of the vintage Sugimori art style in digital watercolors. I actually used the same tools and many of the same techniques here that I use in my artwork for the new one 51. It's not quite the way Rachel told me she does it, but it's close. Well, I mean, then there's tons of other programs that have like built in really cool watercolor effects or like more real media stuff. And I'm just using like one brush in Photoshop. So there are definitely ways to do it like probably easier and better. It's just the way I specifically do it. If you like the way that I did it and you don't want to go through the effort of finding or making your own tools, you can click the link in the description to download the tool set that I use. It includes the pen brush, a soft and a hard watercolor brush, and the watercolor blender as well. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you're enjoying this series and finding it useful. If you have any questions about working with traditional or digital watercolors, let me know in the comments and I'll help you out however I can. And of course, a huge thank you to today's guest lecturer, Rachel Briggs, for talking over the techniques with me and giving me a lot of insight even things that I wasn't able to fit into the video. If you're not already familiar with her work, please do check it out. I do finally have a portfolio site, which is great. That's at uh, racyb.meowcorp.us. So I finally have started putting my art stuff up there. I'll put that link as well as a link to her Twitter in the description. And of course, we can't forget my absolutely wonderful patrons, especially luxury patron Ethan Saffron. Thank you all for your support. I'm Umbrian Libris. I'll see you in the next chapter.